All right, what's up, everybody? This is another episode of the uh, Vanguard Radical Reading, Radical Reader. Um, you know, basically just a catchy name for what we decided to call a book club. Gavin and I, you know, we're both people who always find, our, or at least I can say this about myself, is I want to read more. I always am like, damn, there's so yeah. many books that I want to read. Um, and, you know, it definitely in a time like COVID, it's, it's definitely a good time to, you know, uh, kind of explore good texts and uh, one of the other you know, good things about reading is, you know, kind of discussing it at length. So, you know, that's one of the things that we want to do is kind of create like a little, I don't know, uh, I guess, you know, quote unquote, like in digital community of people who want to come in, uh, potentially if these start going, we'll do them live, you know, just to get like a live uh, audience chat going. Uh, right now, this one's pre-recorded just for convenience sake. We're recording it the night before. Um, but yeah, this week we're going to be going over George Orwell's unsung classic, the George Orwell that they don't want you to read in school. You think you read so much George Orwell, they leave so much of the, they leave all the most interesting parts of the man's life out. He writes this beautiful uh, nonfiction account of his service uh, as a as a militiaman uh, fighting with the the P O U M militia, the a party of uh, Marxist unification, which is the uh, uh, militia, uh, sub, the, the Republican army in the Spanish Civil War. And just for a quick overview of anybody who might not be super familiar with the Spanish Civil War, uh, I wasn't um, before reading this book. Uh, essentially, there were, it was a multi-tiered faction. Uh, there was the rising uh, fascist uh, party in the fascist movement led by uh, um, Franco and um there was also the uh, opposition that uh, George Orwell was affiliated with, which was the Republican Army. And then as a subsect of the Republican Army, there was the, the Palm Militia, which is the specific militia that uh, George Orwell enlisted in. And this was an anarchist uh, militia, completely egalitarian, uh, people working class, uh, you know, bottom up de democratic model that had taken uh, across that had taken form all across Catalonia, which is the portion of uh, Spain, the region of Spain that encompasses uh, Barcelona, borders uh, France uh, on that side of the country, um, and has famously uh, throughout its history uh, had a, a, a streak of independent movement, I, I, I guess, for as long as, you know, it's existed as a, uh, you know, part of Spain. Um, yeah, Gavin, I guess if you want to uh, talk about it, was this, this was your first time reading the book? I imagine it was my first time reading the book. Yeah, it What'd was my think? first yeah, it was the first time reading it for me, and, and I really enjoyed uh, the book. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Orwell is commonly taught in, you know, high schools. 1984 is, of course, a, a classic of dystopian animal farm, animal farm. And, and his influence, you know, just can't be understated when it comes to, you know, pop culture. Obviously, terms like the thought crime and, and many others, you know, you know, pretty much join the common lexicon of uh at least the English language, but they're actually invented by Orwell. Uh, same with like Big Brother, you know, just these terms which are thrown about so, uh, you know, nonchalantly these days as part of our vocabulary. I mean, the term Orwellian doesn't yeah. exist for no reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and of course, last week we talked about Alan Moore's V for Vendetta, which was heavily inspired by George Orwell's 1984. Uh, so yeah, the man's influence can't be understated when it comes to um, fiction, when it comes to pop culture. And of course, uh, the way we think about um, you know, governments too, and, and oppressive states, uh, dystopian uh, realities. So uh, for me, reading Homage to Catalonia from 1938 was a great kind of insight into, uh, you know, some of the some of the ways that he came up with these concepts or uh, just a window into, uh, you know, what formed his political persuasions. Um, and of course, which would go on to result in those in those classics. I think this is just uh, such an important uh, text as far as understanding George Orwell as a person and, and also his politics, which, you know, were infamous for changing a little bit throughout his life. You know, he remained a pretty dedicated, devout socialist, but, you know, his feelings on things like pacifism, for example, did, uh, you know, undergo uh, quite a few evolutions throughout his life. So I think it's a very interesting point to um, start any conversation about George Orwell or uh, his politics, because you just get to see, you know, the breeding ground for uh, so much of what he um, you know, comes to understand is what governments are and their and their roles in society. So, yeah, I really enjoyed this book. And and like you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, you know, doing this book club or whatever you want to call it is it's great because, you know, this is a book I've had on my list for a while, but uh, probably wouldn't have gotten around to it for a while longer if it weren't for doing this. So I'm I'm really glad I got the opportunity to to read it. And like I said, just have a better understanding of George Orwell. Yeah. And what's crazy about this 
man, and, and this is our first time talking about George Orwell, so I'll go ahead and go on a little bit of a tangent, but this is a guy who died in 1950. And one of the things that you and I have talked about, and you know, for anybody who doesn't let regularly listen to uh, the podcast, Gavin and I have been friends since, you know, we were children. So we, you know, all of our academic learning things were kind of, you know, paralleling each other. We grew up uh, at either the same school or same district. So, you know, we were both reading, uh, uh, you know, Animal Farm and, uh, you know, later 1984 at around the same time. And I remember our first discussion about 1984, uh, you know, is it, it's it, one of them at least was that it's so crazy how, you know, you were pointing out how crazy it is that it, it does feel a little bit like an eye roll, but it's because so many people have taken inspiration from 1984 uh, in a way that like now it, when you go back and revisit the initial text, you're like, wow, this almost seems contrived, even though it was like so brand new and all, you know, George Orwell. And, you know, that's one of the things that I that it, 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 I think that if you teach George Orwell's politics, which not which are never taught uh, in tangent with uh, 1984, you know, there's no mention. They le- literally you, look, you read two books about this guy and you have to learn so much worthless horseshit about so many other authors. They don't even teach you that he was shot in the fucking throat. I remember being I was uh, he I, I remember I was reading this book for this. <laughs> He, I'm reading, he shots in, and I'm asking, I'm like, what the fuck? Does he live? He How almost he died. Running? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the descriptions that he gives and, you know, talking about how, you know, his relationship and, and not to just skip ahead, but, you know, he's talking about how if he'd seen the guy that shot him, he would have said good shot because, you know, he would have shot him if he could see him too. Like, you know, and just like these like weird, complicated feelings, right? Like George Orwell, when he showed up in Spain, showed up as an as like an independent reporter. He didn't speak fucking Spanish. He wanted to see what was going on with this like worker co-op model that had taken over essentially uh, in uh, Spanish uh, or whatever the, the 36 through 39 ish in uh, that uh, Catalonia, Spain, it was a completely egalitarian structure. They almost abandoned like the entire concept of money. It was essentially anarchism. Right. And uh, you know, that's such a incendiary radical, crazy term, like even more so than something like communism. It's like, you can't even be taken seriously if you uh, use the term anarchism, which is actually something Orwell observed uh, in the text, he was like an English anarchism is such like an like a ridiculous term. You can't even, he doesn't even, he didn't even want to refer to the people as that, um, like in one of his notes. But this is a guy who who shows up and is so moved by the cause that he feels compelled to for as a, as a foreigner uh, take up arms with these individuals and in, in almost in like a you know cinematic you know act of hero heroism, I guess if you want to call it that, or just like you know. Uh, valor whatever the adjective is that i guess you would use to describe uh you know joining in with the working class of a country you have no you know physical connection to and feeling that level of solidarity you know it it kind of harkens the level of solidarity that came from like che Guevara when he showed up in cuba and was like hey like let's do this or when he went to bolivia and was like hey let's do you know what i'm saying so i i just feel like when you get all of that in tangent it's you're so much more inclined to take his him as a writer like seriously and then his you know fiction it falls into place and you're like wow this is a guy who's literally seen history unfold with his own eyes I mean he you know I I don't know I I just I think that when I first read 1984 I didn't get it um and then when I reread Animal Farm as like a more of an adult because I think I read it the first time when I was like 14 and and admittedly I didn't really probably pay attention to it I was just like a fucking shitty ass student uh, but when I later in life read Animal Farm, I was like, oh, this is fucking crazy. Like Orwell is a radical, you know, and then reading Homage to Catalonia. I'm like, yes, dude, this is this guy is, you know, it, it, it's almost it almost even push the boundaries of what, what I thought humanly possible. Right. Because you yeah. read about anarchism in theory, you read somebody like, you know, Peter Kropotkin, or for me, I read a lot of uh, David Graeber, who we'll talk about more in this episode. His dad actually fought in the Spanish Civil War, which I imagine influenced a lot of his politics and thinking he became probably one of the most renowned anarchist thinkers of his generation before he passed tragically uh, just a few months ago. Um, so yeah, the, the the fact that they were able to orchestrate uh, not only a uh, community uh, in uh, peacetime, but he actually makes the observation that like it may be even d- because of the wartime transition that they were able to kind of, you know, get this off of the ground. And then he was, you know, all of these things are completely contradictory to the English mindset or the American mindset, which is, you know, that same Western mentality that like you couldn't possibly have an army that's egalitarian. Yet when he joined the militia, there were no ranks. Um, another thing I just wanted to spotlight a quote that I uh, immediately caught my 
um, I, and I wrote down as soon as I started reading, you know, pretty, pretty short into, or pretty quickly into chapter one, um, you know, something that we obviously talk about, you know, revolutionary uh, movements and stuff like that a lot on this podcast and on the left in general, and especially lately, you know, we've been seeing uh, so much protests and uh, so much revolutionary spirits on the street that something we often um, ponder or think about is kind of like, you know, what would uh, what what would it look like on the day after the revolution? What would a worker controlled or worker ran uh, state actually look like? And uh, when Orwell shows up to Barcelona in the in the first chapter of this book, he's he's kind of met with just that and, and describes it very eloquently. He says practically every building of any size had been seized by the workers and was draped with red flags or with the red and black flag of the anarchists. Every wall was scrawled with the hammer and sickle and with the initials of the revolutionary party. Uh, all of this was very queer and moving. There was much of it in it that I did not understand. In some ways I did not even, I did not even like it, but I recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Uh, so I think that that off the bat kind of gives you an insight into this very, um, you know, moving, uh, you know, site that he was met with when he when he got to Barcelona and kind of what inspired um, his, his desires. Like you said, uh, he, he recognized it immediately as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Uh, he goes on to describe, you know, people being a lot nicer than he expected, uh, you know, not having to be uh, lectured by a barber when he tried to tip, you know, stuff like that. So I think that right off the bat, you know, you get a great uh, kind of, you know, description of what, you know, a more worker ran state could look like, which I just thought was an interesting uh, kind of place to start with. We talk about anarchy, you know, you know, society without, uh, you know, direct leaders or necessarily um, rules that aren't, you know, the absolute necessity. Uh, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of cool that he starts off with describing the Barcelona that kind of does resemble that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that that can be, you know, extrapolated on into the end of the book when he's kind of, uh, you know, talking about his time as a fugitive after he's gotten his discharge papers and he's hiding out in the more bourgeois, uh, you know, ritzy where he's like completely changed his entire aesthetic to uh, fit in with the wealthy aristocrats because he's trying to hide the fact that he was uh, with the uh, Palm uh, militia and because after they'd been outlawed. Um, and he is while while he's doing that, he's still simultaneously like dressed up in this garb, but he's still sprawling in big letters, uh, you know, the. Uh, you know, symbols and, you know, the POW um, lives on and Viva La, you know, all, all that other stuff, the Viva La Revolution, all this, you know, uh, iconography just to continue this messaging because it was what moved him a, a foreigner, somebody, you know, with no call to this cause, like, you know, he felt like that was like the least of his com uh, contributions that he could make. And yeah, I, I think that that coupled with also, um, the fact that they uh, ran the militia just completely without hierarchy. And one of the other yeah. things that I thought was really interesting uh, that I wanted to talk about uh, early on, he talks about in his experience in the front, one of the things that really shocked him was the fact that these, uh, that the militia men uh, with the palm would literally, uh, you know, shout at the fascists across the lines, you know, because this is in the late thirties. So this is still trench warfare modeled off of, uh, World War One uh, style trench warfare hadn't evolved with what would come in World War Two, uh, so they were literally in trenches, you know, five hundred, a thousand yards away from me, so so close that you could literally holler and and hear, and they would be talking about how. Uh, and Orwell thought this was like completely unbelievable, right? As an Englishman, like, you know, you take prisoners or you shoot the enemy, right? But these, uh, you know, Catalonians thought, uh, you know, no, these are just workers that have been misled by the fascists. Uh, they they need to join the working party. They need to join us. These are just workers. These are not the enemy. The enemy are the fascist leadership. The enemy is Franco. The enemy is, you know, the communist bourgeoisie, which is another observation that you, you and I talked about, which is uh, the fact that, like, you know, in, in this case, George, George Orwell is very anti-communism because yeah. he's referring to the, you know, not the Trotskyist revolutionary communism, uh, but the Stalinist totalitarian, uh, you know, uh, uh communism uh, that yeah, would he would more later rail against yeah the more authoritative form. like more authoritative uh totalitarian forms of communism more like state uh centered forms of communism exactly and uh and yeah th that's a great point too with you said um about the trench warfare and stuff that's another great aspect of this book that i think is um a little bit underrated you know it's, it's a great you know book about trench warfare and about war in general yeah, it kind of has Hemingway vibes to me you yeah, know or... that's a great point it really does and 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 as you mentioned with um Orwell's observation when he was shot 
uh, about how, you know, had he actually met the shooter, the sniper, rather he would, he would have, you know, congratulated him on the good shot. The, the book is laced with similar dark humor, you know, when he's uh, describing the, the massive disgusting rats that, uh, you know, are in the trenches or the lice. The lice. That, yeah, yeah. That infect the, the people's, you know, hair, you know, it, it's obviously um, very dark. And, and since jo or George Orwell actually came from, uh, you know, a, somewhat of a place of privilege, uh, coming into this war, he actually, you know, probably was even more startled by these factors than some of the, you know, comrades he was with. Yeah, I don't know. What I guess we can just kind of go into a few of the quotes that I, I thought that were I thought were, you know, remarkably prescient as they yeah. to read them in 2020, because it's always, you know, like we were talking, the foresight of a guy like George Orwell is something that you only appreciate more and more with time with, you know, when I was you know, 14 year old freshman in high school, you know, I, I didn't give him the, you know, attention that now I'm like, wow, I can't yeah. believe this. You died in 1950. This is like, oh, this is very prescient. Like this is extreme foresight. But anyway, uh, he said, uh, he has this quote uh, where he says, the wealthy liberals are the most ardent supporters of fascism when it appears in the modern sense. And I thought that was pretty interesting um, because you, you start to realize what fascism really is, is it is a, a, an extreme focus on, uh, financial interests, right? And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, a writer like Chris Hedges warned is that once it no longer becomes uh, possible to uh, continue the wants and the will of the rich and the opulent using these, you know, limited democratic means uh, that we currently have, that is when something like fascism starts to take hold. And there are a number of writers who uh, observe, uh, I learned this unique, uh, interesting fact from Matt Stoller. He wrote this book, Goliath, an antitrust book, but it's a great book. We might do an episode about it, but either way, uh, he uh, writes about how U U.S. business was extremely, extremely warm towards uh, uh, Mussolini in Italy and uh, the entire fascist movement, and even uh, throughout, um, uh, we can talk about this also. Uh, if, uh, as Noam Chomsky uh, said, I think we have we may have a video clip uh, of it. But he literally Noam Chomsky literally goes into the fact that uh, FDR point was sending uh, oil to fascists in Spain. You know, uh, before, back when the United States was tr still trying to do the whole neutrality uh, thing. Um, you know, and, and basically thwarting any chance that the Catalonian, you know, Republican revolution had at, uh, you know, victory in Spain. Uh, so, yeah. you know, he has this quote that said it was at least inherently likely that the British government, which had not raised a finger to save the Spanish government from Franco, would intervene quickly enough to save its own working or to save it from its own working class. Yep. And that's exactly what the United States ended up doing, uh, violating the embargo under um, FDR and sending them oil. Um, so I, I just thought that was an interesting little parallel. And also the fact that that's entirely likely that the United States would do that in any revolution, whether that occurred domestically or abroad. Uh, like we've seen time and time again, whether it was Bolivia or Venezuela or Allende in Chile or any of the other times when the United States uh, pulled a coup in uh, Central or South America. Yeah, that, that also brings to mind another quote that I, I wrote down um, from the novel, which uh, is basically his observation that uh, Franco was not strictly comparable with Hitler or Mussolini. And in fact, his rising was more of a military mutiny uh, backed up by the aristocracy and the church. Uh, it was not an attempt so much to impose fascism as to restore feudalism. This meant that Franco had against him not only the working people, uh, but also various sections of the liberal bourgeoisie, the very people who are the supporters of fascism when it appears in a more modern form. So, yeah, I think that's a very interesting uh, way to look at it. And, yeah, oftentimes, as you said, um, the most wealthy or affluent and people that would. Yeah, that's like, yeah, that's ex almost the exact same quote. Yeah, he really yeah. like brings it home, I think. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I mean, often, like I said, the most affluent uh, people that consider them liberals end up uh, do supporting, uh, you know, these kind of policies without even realizing the effects or consequences of them, the more fascistic. Which uh, kind of recalls our conversation with Ryan Knight even. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. So I think that that's one of the most, um, you know, prescient and enduring observations of this uh, book. Another one that I wanted to um, talk about with you because I, I just kept... I couldn't get over it while I, you know, reading this, just the, the truth that it holds and uh, how much this sentiment endures. But, um, and, and I'll read another quote, but he says, um, when he gets there, I did not realize that there were 
serious differences between the political parties. And Monte Pesedro, when they pointed to the position on our left and said, those are the socialists referring PSUC, I was puzzled and said, aren't we all socialists? I thought it was idiotic that people fighting for their lives should have separate parties. My attitude was always, can we drop all this political nonsense and get on with the war? Uh, so that reminds me, of course, of the extremely overly factionalized left. You know, we're obviously united against certain enemies, but uh, the left, as we talk about on the show all the time, loves to, you know, divide into all of these subgroups and subcategories and and kind of section them off from each other based on uh, kind of arbitrary or, or stupid, um, you know, meaning. So I think that that's a good, uh, you know, they definitely reminded me of that. Although another part of this book that I liked was the, you know, some of the solidarity within those political classes, you know. So uh, I think that there's a lot of interesting observations. What did you make of all that factionalization that he talked about? Yeah, you know, and I think just to be straight up with anybody, anybody that's like a normal person that reads this book, that's like the most difficult part of this read. Gavin and I would be remiss not to just like come straight out and be like, if you're like, you're going to want to have like a notepad, like with the list of every like militia and faction and then like a translation of like what George Orwell actually asserts what they are, right? Um, because you'll see a party and you'll be like, oh, these are the communists. And then you're like, oh, word, the communists. And then they're like, no, no, fuck the communists. These are the bourgeoisie fuckers from Russia. Like, you know, and then it's like the Trotskyites. And then it's like, oh, wait, no, Trotskyite is like, like, no, like technically, like a lot of their ideas are like Trotskyite, but like that's just a smear that means fascism, which is why they tried to arrest the two uh, leaders of the uh, 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 POUM militia, the POM militia. And they smeared them as being like fascist collaborators and like fascist coordinators when in reality they were not. And they'd actually broken with Trotsky over political disagreements about unification, actually, of all things. So, uh, yeah, it's a super difficult mess of things to follow. But I think the point that you're making at and the point that George Orwell was making stands is the fact that like we have a real issue right here there is a real working class that's these are there there there's so much misery and despair and we see this domestically but it's only compounded when you despair the misery and the horror um of, of a place like i mean look at a place like yemen probably one of the most despair ridden uh horrifying places in, in wastelands in the earth and you know it's the as we've talked about on you know in the past it's the united states manufactured weapons that are going there and it's one of the most devastating and criminal aspects of the Trump administration is, is a complete lack of conscience and one of the like certain, you know, that, that to me, that is probably one of, that was the biggest reason why I did vote for Joe. I did vote for Joe Biden uh, is uh, with that in mind. And the fact that, that, you know, of the few things that, you know, Joe Biden would do is he would not veto bipartisan resolution to make sure that we weren't doing that, but not to derail the conversation. But I just think that this um, over factionalization of, uh, the left as we see it now and as we've talked about how we need to have unity between the you know party for socialism and liberation and the party for um, you know DSA and uh, Green Party and uh, in you know independence of, of a liberal mindset and you know left-leaning uh, libertarians uh, and, and, you know anybody right because at the end of the day I can stand um, you know on a mountaintop again and, and you know say I am what I am and pound my chest and you know I'm an anarcho-syndicalist and it's like who the fuck is that and what like what the fuck does that matter says the average Joe right like it doesn't impact my life at all so let's get some unity together and move forward is I think the point Orwell's making yeah 100 percent and and actually I uh, I was reading this um, article too that was by Forbes that kind of talked about um, Orwell uh, his diagnosis of why some people actually working people end up being turned off by socialism. And I thought that it made some really good points about exactly what we're talking about, which is uh, kind of that um, here, it says socialism also, or socialists also knew, know little about those they wish to help. Their language is a dead giveaway of their ignorance. And the 20th century socialists lace their diatribes about industrial capitalism with jargon such as dialectical materialism and class consciousness, their spiritual heirs decry systems of oppression and exhort people to be woke, no matter, or no average man speaks or thinks in those terms, yet he is the one who must be educated. So I, is I think that Orwell that, or the guy that wrote the Forbes no, article? No, that's, that's the guy that wrote the Forbes article. Oh, that guy's, and, yeah, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a, and uh, the Forbes article is written from a slightly uh, like centristy um, point of view. So I don't necessarily totally uh, stand by all of the all sure. of that article, but I think it's making a good point that the left uh, does tend to really over 
jargonify and you know it gets like you said anarcho syndicalism versus anarcho libertarianism versus social libertarianism all of this crazy stuff that yeah most actual working people they don't think or speak in capitalism those equals terms. racism doesn't compute yeah. as a you know exactly like, it, yeah you know although i although sometimes i although sometimes i feel like you know um sometimes the the there are a lot of disingenuous criticisms of sloganeering. Like I saw a really good tweet, uh, tweet that uh, my girlfriend showed me and it was like, uh, or maybe you showed it. I don't remember who shows. I don't have my own Twitter, so I never see my own tweets uh, or any tweets, but uh, it was uh, defund the police is a good slogan. You're just a racist. And it was like, you know, I was like, Oh, that's pretty good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> No. Yeah. That well, And that's actually where I, I prefer the directness of a slogan, like defund the police. Exactly. That's it. A hundred percent. But you know what I mean? People are always like, Oh, you can't defund the police is a terrible slogan. So I was like, yeah. I do understand people yeah. who are wary of that as like a, like a, uh, yeah. what's it called in, uh, like a not an invalid criticism but like a, in, a dishonest criticism like like a bad you know what I mean? criticism it's disingenuous i think is the yeah. word i'm searching for and hey speaking of the uh the you know modern movement again or to defund the police or um the movement uh against uh the police um there's a there's a few quotes in here that i wrote down from orwell himself that i think uh leads me to believe that he would have been on the side of uh you know antifa he says um when i joined the militia i had promised myself to kill one fascist after all if each of us had killed one, then they would all soon be extinct. Uh, there's another great quote where he says, I have no particular love for the idealized worker as he appears in the bourgeois communist mind. But when I see an actual flesh and blood worker in conflict with his natural enemy, the policeman, I do not have to ask myself which side I am on. So yeah, that it's no, yeah. <laughs> dude, and it's so egalitarian and it's, it's effortlessly egalitarian in its messaging, right? This is why Marx didn't stick, right? Because I and you, two people who, as far from like historical standard, I mean, I have like a fucking high school diploma. I'm not like tooting my horn, but I'm just saying you and I have had the opportunity to be really well educated because we're living in 2020, right? And we have access to a lot of information. You know, when Marx published, you know, uh, Capital or when he published the Communist Manifesto, like the average pub, the proletariat, uh, you know, thinking right the, their intellect their, i mean it, whether if they were literate they were lucky you know what i mean so yeah. uh, that was the big miss for him right is that he was an economy he you know he was he was thinking up here you you can't have jargon like that that's effective that's what people that's what people completely miss about the trump effect the trump effect is is real and effective because he knows how to speak to people in ways that sticks in your brain and he's not afraid to just steal the best slogans from the past like half of his slogans are reagan or pat buchanan slogans right it, like they're not original it doesn't fucking matter right you don't need original sloganeering you need hey workers unite like solidarity like stick with your fucking working class like you know all blood bleeds red like you know shit like that yeah and, and i think that uh you know so much can be can be learned from that and i think that uh i think orwell would totally agree with everything we're saying here i think that he totally observed uh these problems and 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 honestly rose above them i mean i think if you look at a lot of his writing and a lot of his um you know thinking on these matters he does speak in a more um in a, in a more understandable way that wouldn't uh you know just be totally written off as the ramblings of an intellectual, you know, communist or, you know what I'm saying? Like he definitely does uh, speak. I mean, I guess that's part of the reason why so many of his works have endured. You look at something like uh, 1984 or Animal Farm and, and obviously they're, they're specifically written to, to the point where they can be understood by- and There's nothing uh, wrong with that. Like there's no, nothing there's inherently not. superior about using highbrow language. And that's one of the things that I wish people would drive home more. Like if you can articulate, it's, and, and you know, it's kind of like one of the, if you can articulate yourself clearly and distill your thoughts into words that everybody can understand, like you are far more intelligent. Like that's what you want to do, right? Like Plato understood this. Socrates understood this. They broke their shit down, you know, into oration, right? Like that's how their shit was passed down. You think they were using these ginormous ass words? No, they fucking weren't. Like these ginormous words are a way of um, keeping these you know, ideas in the darkness, right? Because they're, you know, if you put them into egalitarian terms and they're inf infectious, right? And, and if you keep them behind a lock and key, so you have to do like eight years uh, of study into the economy and you're so in debt that you're, you know, just going to decide to, you know, jump into one of the great uh, turns of phrase Orwell here is that the, much of the working class viewed capitalism as a central swindling machine, which it is. 
you know, uh, central swindling machine. Exactly. Another popular, uh, you know, tweet that I, I want to give credit to, but I don't know who the fuck showed it to me or, or made it, but it was just like, uh, there's two, two, one dig for or capitalists and Marxists both understand capitalism. The only, only one of them thinks it's wrong. And like, that's kind of the racket you get into by the time you're like that deep into your economics degree. You're like, Oh wait, this is just like, you know, uh, fucking like, you know, like uh, swindling people at scale, basically, yeah. right? This is like, this is essentially like uh, scamming at scale, um, and and everybody's in on it. Uh, once you get, but you're so in debt if you are from the proletariat or you've never come from the proletariat, so you don't give a fuck. And they just convince you that everybody, you know, they convince you that we're in this like faux meritocracy. Uh, but once you look at the numbers and you understand compounding wealth and and that, that this is all horseshit, like you understand that capitalism is rigged and. You know, when I got to that point, I was like three years deep into a business degree and I was like, fuck this. And I pieced out. Right. You know what I mean? But like a lot of people stick around and they're like, no, I have to pay off my student loans. Yeah. Which I mean, is unfortunately uh, the way the system traps you, you know, you have to survive in the system that exists. It's, it's hard to just, uh, you know, unless you have extreme privilege to exist from with outside of a system that is inherently exploitative. And, and that actually, actually leads me to another, uh, I think, good point, uh, which this novel Brooches a few times, which which kind of comes down to it's a you, nonfiction book, though. So it's sorry, not, not novel. novel, not novel memoir, I guess is what you would really call it. But uh, um, yeah, th this notion that kind of like uh, democracy, if not directly equals, uh, leads to fascism or enables it. Uh, do you think there's any merit to that in a system that is already inherently capitalist, inherently exploitative? You know, uh, voting for these people or you know continuing this charade of democracy when you know, of course, capitalism is the expense of so many rights. Uh, it, is that a form of fascism or at least an, an enabler of it, do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's certainly right. Like it's it's not, you know, Franco fascism, right? Like he said, which is, you know, he, uh, which, you know, kind of which was, you know, he argued was just a restoration of feudalism, which was not exactly what the bourgeoisie were interested in. They were interested in the kind of fascism that was more like Mussolini fascism, which is like the the wealthy shop owners tyranny, ty like creating tyranny, which I uh, would uh, you know, say how different is that? That's only marginally different than, you know, private, you know, companies raiding this tyranny over, which is always one of my great criticisms of right leaning libertarians who are, you know, you know, so, um, you know, concerned with personal freedom and the ability to make choices that I am. And yet they're not at all concerned with private corporations tyranny. So, uh, I definitely, I definitely think that to an extreme, it's kind of like, yes, uh, because I think anarcho-capitalism is almost just fascism, really, because how, how else is it going to present itself? It's private fascism. So, yeah. you know, uh, essentially fascism could be imposing that as a state or it could be imposing it as like, you know, Amazon is now worth, you know, 60% of the, you know, global domestic output. Um, and now everybody's just like forced to play their game. And in which case, then it's just private fascism, right? So I, I do think that's 100% the case, which brings me to a question that I jotted down for you. Is anarchism the opposite of fascism? And do you expect to see a, a resurgence of anarchism in the 21st century as a viable political option? Because outside of Rojava, we'll get into the conflicting perspectives on that later, but outside of Rojava, there's been almost no... Uh, bottom-up democracy, we'll call it, uh, movement since, or of its kind, at the scale of this, of its kind since the Spanish Civil War. Do you expect to see that as a, as a growing alternative, especially when we look at the eco side that's occurring and the, you know, one of the observations that people have made, uh, I don't know whether or not you subscribe to this, but it's actually in times of chaos, um, you know, almost like a reverse shock doctrine, you know, obviously when uh, Naomi Klein famously made the point in her book, The Shock Doctrine, that during uh, times of, you know, global shock, or, you know, whether that be man caused in the case of 9-11, when we gave up all of our security rights, or in the case of a natural disaster, when all of the shoreline of Sri Lanka uh, was bought up and privatized and the fishermen ousted, just to give two examples from her book. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just think 100%. And, and again, um, just to connect back a little bit to our conversation we had last week about Alan Moore, um, I, I think that, you know, this book really goes on to reinforce the notion that, uh, indeed, anarchism is chiefly uh, a reaction, you know, it's a reactionary policy. And this is something that uh, Noam Chomsky has even talked about a lot, you know, how anarchism is not necessarily, uh, you know, the most realistic actual form of setting up a society, but it is uh, an extremely productive reaction to authoritarianism or to fascism. And I think that, yeah, especially when you, when you, uh, you know, bring, bring up the eco side and the environmental movement, I think something that'll, uh, a burgeoning movement that 
um, we're, we're going to see is more um, uh, green anarchism or environmental anarchism. Uh, I don't know if there's a more specific term for it, but but yeah, kind of using one the, up. That's how they that's how they come to, to pass. Exactly. But but yeah, as a reaction to these systems uh, where you where there has to be an acknowledgement that electoral politics is not enough. And, and that would certainly be the case when it comes to uh, the eco side that has um, come in, um, from capitalism. You know, you're not going to vote your way out of that. You're not. And especially if you're uh, one of, uh, you know, a, a tribe in the Amazon jungle that's having your home destroyed by the paper companies, you know, right? Like it's easy to outsource. Or um, your water poison, which is an ongoing yeah. matter that's still happening yeah. now. Yeah, or your water, per- if your resources uh, <laughs> or home livelihood is directly being threatened by, um, you know, these trees capitals, cut down, forests cut down. Industries. that on fire. In, in, it's absolutely uh, fascism. And to say otherwise is just privilege. Uh, so, the, yeah, I think that um, anarchism has to be, um, you know, mounted as a, as a, as a challenge to this, to this growing fascism, this growing corporate fascism, especially that we see in the 21st century. Uh, and again, I, I think that, um, you know, we can talk about how you could actually structure an, a real realistic society um, around the tenets of anarchism, or if that's possible. But I think that at very least anarchism is an amazing tool uh, to break out against um, fascism, to break out as a demonstration of, you know, the kind of values that should be um, emphasized at the expense of those that are valued in a capitalist exploitative um, society. So, so yeah, absolutely. I think we will see, see more of it. And, and uh, I think that's, you know, totally the fault of kind of um, the elite class for, for allowing the state of affairs to get to this, this point where, uh, you know, people are again, considering anarchism and looking at it as a, you yeah, know, I guess I should ask this question first, but could you uh, define anarchism as you, you know, uh, perceive it? You know, for me, I just think free association, direct democracy. Uh, yeah, obviously, yeah. you have non-negotiables when it comes to, you know, women's rights, as they've also established in Rojava uh, in Kurdistan uh, and, uh, you know, immigrant rights, especially in the time of COVID or I mean, not COVID, uh, eco, uh, you know, eco- eco- um, ecological disaster uh one of the things that I worry about too is that in the in the time of economic, I keep saying economic disaster because we're currently living through one. The future ecological disaster uh, that's also we're currently living through, but will only be ramped up to an exponential degree, uh, is that it, obviously that is going to create so many um, displaced people, right? Refugees, if you want to call them that. Uh, but the, the, these will be um, uh, people of our globe, other humans that uh, have had their uh, you know, patch of dirt that they were born on, destroyed by people who weren't born on that patch of dirt, us, you know, our people, the people that are in, 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 in oh, it wasn't me. Yeah, well, you're reaping the benefit of it because you got your lights on and you're eating food uh, that, you know, doesn't domestically grow where you're from and, you know, all this other shit that we're all paying. A tr- whether, it's not your fault, but it's a reality that we all have to grapple with, right? So what, what do we need to do from that is we need to have immense solidarity with all of those people beyond nationalism beyond the patch of dirt that we were born on and for me anarchism is the answer to that but i want to also ask you to kind of say where do you fall and where how do you view anarchism i I mean to me anarchism is is basically a a society where people can you know live freely A, a good a good um analogy i've heard used to describe anarchism it's like you know if a child runs in front of a road um, it's within the parents' right to grab them and use their force to prevent them from being hit by a car and killed. But that's about the extent to which, uh, you know, force should be ever used, uh, you know, by the state or by any authoritative figure or body, um, you know, to kind of enforce edicts or whatever you want to call them uh, on a person's life. And uh, now, obviously, when it comes to the environmental movement, you have to obviously enforce rules against corporations. But when it comes to a personal, um, you know, it's almost kind of like volunteerism, you know, doing. But how do like, corporation even exist under anarchism? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, that's and and that is obviously the difference between anarcho-capitalism and, uh, and uh, more left-leaning forms of anarchism, uh, which would you know exclude uh, corporations because they would uh, cross those you know thresholds, which would not even be allowed in an anarchist system to begin with. Obviously, much of corporations uh, doesn't I mean, I guess if a bunch of people freely associated and everybody, one person, one vote gets together and, you know, creates a product and sell it, I guess that could also meet the definition of a, a corporation. Should yeah, be yeah. So narrow-minded. But, yeah, I, I mean, and again, that's where it kind of uh, starts to be like, how do you actually, you know, structure such a society? But, but I think that there's a lot of values inherent in anarchism that are extremely 
um, beneficial to, you know, keep in mind and, and the chief among them just being, uh, you know, personal rights and the, and the sacredness of, uh, you know, personal freedom and decision making, whether it, uh, you know, comes to doing drugs or what you want to do or say freedom of speech, all of these things that we do uh, see eroded by capitalist systems, by um, governments that have authoritative uh, notions or, um, you know, ideas about what is moral or what is not moral, you know, censorship usually tends to spring up, uh, political violence, obviously, um, demagoguery. So I, I think, again, it's, it's a reactionary force that can be really used to inform, uh, you know, how governments should be structured, because obviously, you know, we, I mean, we, we do need some level of government, it's a very, very minimal sense. And again, I think that's where anarchism should be um, kind of um, called into mind is, is how to structure that, how to infringe on people's rights as little as humanly possible, while also, uh, you know, ensuring the rights of the marginalized and and the disenfranchised, because obviously, uh, you know, you have to there, like you said, there are unalienable rights and, and certain people do need to be protected. Yeah. And I think that I, I sent over a, a clip to you. I don't know if you have it handy, but it's uh, David Graeber, um, who we spoke about earlier. Uh, and, and he gives a, some great insight in this clip that I want to play. And we don't have to listen to the whole thing because it is a little long, but I do want to play a good bit of it because I think he does such a great job of kind of laying out uh the fact that it's not quite anarchism that's occurring in uh, Rojava right now, but it's one of the closest experiments that we've got. And here's how they're laying it out. And, you know, here's what he thinks about it. Uh, and for somebody who's, you know, uh, probably, like I said, one of the, the foremost anarchist thinkers of, of our time before he passed uh, just a few months ago. Um, yeah, I think it's really, you know, enlightening perspective. So if you just want to go ahead and play it, we'll, we'll jump on. Yeah, just tell me when to stop playing it. Cool. Is ever experimenting with direct democracy. Can you tell me a little bit about what brought you there and certainly from the very beginning? It's worse than I found them, but they found me. Um, there's people involved in the Kurdish freedom movement that, that it, you know, it started or it emerged in the PKK, which is a rather conventional Marxist, Leninist, you know, guerrilla group in, in, in its origins. But um, something about its history took it in this radically new direction. A lot of it was internal processes of women guerrillas sort of asserting themselves and introducing feminism as a big theme. If we can pause it right here just for a moment. Uh, the specific militia that uh, he's referencing right now, we spoke to a uh, former militia member uh, and former uh, congressional candidate, uh, Christopher Halali uh, in Vermont, uh, who was a, a member of uh, that militia and, and, and uh, fighting alongside the uh, Kurdish people. So if anybody's interested in that interview, uh, definitely uh, check that out on our blog, but anyway, we can go ahead and continue here. Yeah, he provided some fascinating in insight into that situation. Well, evolution of their leader, Ojalan, has become this, since his arrest and imprisonment in this like island prison in, in um, Turkey, has been reading a lot of Marie Bookchin and a lot of feminist theory and again, came around to a much more anarchist position, basically. He's, you know, they decided that rather than demanding a state of their own, they wish to simply make borders irrelevant and dissolve away states entirely. And it's kind of made sense to people in that part of the world. Remember the Kurds are a population who are divided between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Um, the idea of they're somehow carving a government out of that seems unlikely. And um, they also make the rather common point you hear a lot of actually. People say, well, you know, we come to realize in this part of the world, Demanding your own country is basically the same as saying, I demand the right to be tortured by secret policemen speaking my own language. Yeah. It's not much of a demand. <laughs> so, so they've come around to this idea of bottom-up direct democracy and sort of eliminating borders is the best way that they could come up with something like a Kurdistan that would make sense. So yeah, the, I think the borders, uh, you know, notion is also a big, a big part of this that Which I forgot Which is why... To yeah, go for it. Sorry, I didn't oh, mean to you're Oh, you're good. I was going to no. say, I, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about when I uh, was talking about the climate uh, issue, right? One of the things that really influenced my politics, um, and especially the more I read into it and the more horrified I got and the more hopeless that I realized the situation was, um, the fact that we're uh, we're going to be dealing with a humanitarian crisis like we've never even imagined uh, it, it very soon. 
Um, and I think the only feasible way of handling this in a way that it has that minimizes the undoubtable atrocities that will occur yeah. is if we abandon this completely antiquated, barbaric concept of country, right? This idea that the patch of dirt that you're born on uh, is in some way significant and is in some way a way of binding you to your other humans in a way that if they were, I mean, when you think about it, I think it comes back down to the, and I don't want to get derailed by this, but I think it comes down to the fact of this, like, look at the fact that we were born in Kansas, right? But I, I mean, I was born in Missouri and you were, I don't know where the fuck you were born, but we grew up a lot of our life in Kansas, right? You I think you were born in Illinois if I had to bet, but uh, anyway, uh, we, we, we cross borders all the time, right? Whether you're in Kansas nope. City, Kansas, you're in Kansas City, Missouri, oh, Kansas City, Missouri, oh, you're Olathe, Kansas, Johnson County, whatever the fuck, yeah. right? Always crossing borders, right? Uh, you're like, this is kind of horseshit. Like, who cares if you live on Missouri? Who cares if you live on whatever, right? Um, it's all just make whatever. That's the same thing if you live in uh, the United States or if you live in Indonesia or Yemen or Iran or Venezuela, the thing is, is that we have to get past all of this, right? I mean, I don't want to be the guy that quotes John Lennon, right? Imagine there's no country, right? <laughs> but, uh, it's true. It's true. And, and that's a great uh, point that I never really thought of. But I mean, the United States of America is, uh, you know, a good model for how the entire world could be structured. You know, uh, obviously, the states have some level of independence. There's the whole, you know, concept of states' rights. Which Federalism, is fun, yeah. Fu fundamental to our, you know, country. But uh, they're, they're, of course, under the umbrella, which is United States of America. And that could be a, you know, a broader, you know, theory for how we could uh, organize the entire world, right? You know, giving the countries there, obviously, some degree of individuality. It's not like everyone just needs to be the same. You know, you can't just dissolve culture and dissolve Free association. Yeah, you know. uh, there are obviously are, um, you know, traditions and heritage that does, you know, separate one country from another. And, and often that comes from, you know, oppression in the past and stuff. People, you know, like uh, different people, you know, identify strongly with their, with their countrymen and, and all of that stuff. But um, yeah, there's yeah, no but nation is different than culture would be my, my only thing. Yeah, like, I'm not talking about obviously like absolutely. unitarian culture. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Kansas or Missouri or Illinois or Texas, they all, they all have their own uh, independent economies. They're all doing their own independent thing, but yeah, that's not like, me traveling from one state to another uh, has any negative bearing on that other state. If anything, it's a good thing because I'm, you know, now contributing to their state economy and I'm now, you know, doing this stuff. So uh, th there's really no reason the whole world couldn't be, you know, structured in a similar way where there is a united, um, you know, there is not this stupid, cruel sense of, you know, you're not allowed to cross this line in the sand or else you're going to get locked up or it's a criminal offense. That's ridiculous. We, de we definitely need to move beyond that. Uh, as a country, especially and, and when we just planted our fucking country here in the first place. Place is that? Can I even say the place is there? I mean, there is a physical place that you Kurdistan. can say. Oh, well, I went to Rojava. Rojava is, um, or West Kur um, Kurdistan, is the Syrian part of, of Kurdistan. It's um, a large section of, of, of northern Syria along the Turkish border. And about two million people there engaged in what I think considered to be one of the great historical experiments. Um, my father fought in, in the Spanish Civil War, so I kind of grew up in a place where the memories of, of what happened in Spain in 36, 37, 38, you know, were very vivid. And so one reason I, I, I came to be an anarchist is because I always say most people don't think anarchism is a bad idea. They, they think it's insane, right? You know, I mean, the police, the police people just start killing each other. You know, nobody could... You know, actually organize things without leaders, you know, and, and in fact, my father was in Barcelona when it was run by anarchist principles, you know, they just got rid of white collar workers and sure enough, they discovered these were basically bullshit jobs so if they didn't make a difference <laughs> if they weren't there. Um, so having grown up like that, I, I, I you know, understand that it's possible, but there hasn't been an experiment on that scale, like what happened in Spain and the Republican controlled, uh, especially anarchist controlled areas since because you know everybody's so terrible. yeah and that's an important distinction to make just in case we didn't make it clearly enough i know it's really confusing so essentially the republicans were yeah. certainly to the left of franco right but they were not as far left egalitarian abolish all um you know rank in the military what every man is an equal bottom-up democracy uh, that existed more in us in the catalonian region uh which is this a small area that small region of france surrounding barcelona 
Um, I don't know exactly how big it is. Gavin, you could probably say that better. You've been there. I haven't. Uh, I know, yeah, is it it's not that big? It's like the basically the southern region of um, Spain where Catalonia is. It's about like maybe one fourth of the, of the country of Spain, I would say, maybe even a little bit less. But again, the re- Barcelona, which is, of course, the uh, you know biggest area of tourism. Cultural in capital. Day. Yeah, uh, of Spain. So that's the reason why modern day Spain is so um, reluctant to, you know, grant Catalonia its independence. They were yeah, gonna... that's something I wanted to ask you about also. Could you talk about that at all? You've seen the protests there, I imagine. Yeah, right? and, and it's interesting because this isn't really covered at all, uh, you know, in, here in the States. But um, if you're in the area of Spain, certainly in the area of Barcelona, uh, and this is about a year ago, I'm not sure how the pandemic has influenced or impacted any of uh, these going ons. But um, yeah, there, there's basically a massive pro-Catalonian independence movement that is seeking to um, section off from from Spain and, and become its own independent um, country. And, and I'm not 100 percent aware of Catalonia's history, but the, the, it is rooted in, um, you know, uh, oppression. You know, Franco's Spain uh, obviously oppressed the people of Catalonia and they feel that they want to return to their independence. They've also voted, um, you know, a majoritarian vote to return to independence, which has been ignored multiple times uh, by the government. Isn't the guy Spain. there called the president, too? Isn't it like the president of Catalonia? I don't know if that's yeah, true or not. I, I'm not sure if they have their own like individual president, but the, the government of Spain has gone to some lengths to, you know, grant them the feeling of independence. Like the, the language of Catalonian is technically still the national language in that area of Spain. You know, you'll see it on like street signs, uh, stuff in Catalan. Uh, so, you know, th- there are um, some extent being taken to try to restore a sense of individuality and, um, you know, culture to the region. But again, that's not enough for um, a lot of these activists. And, if, and the last time I was in um, Barcelona, I uh, arrived at the airport and um, what would normally be about a 20 minute, um, you know, taxi ride into the city was two hours long because activists had totally shut down the city. Uh, every major street in into the city, this was around Christmas time, um, totally shut down uh, as a protest because actually um, high ranking officials from uh, Madrid were coming to meet in Barcelona, stupidly, um, knowing that this, uh, you know, mayhem was going about, they decided to come in to hold a conference in the middle of Barcelona was met with massive opposition. Like I said, you couldn't get anywhere in the city, uh, at least by car without just experiencing massive blockades. And, um, you know, at a pretty crazy level, like something that you wouldn't really even imagine here in the States. Uh, You can't imagine the European style protesting. Yeah, exactly. We've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the French and how how willing they are to, you know, shut down the transportation infrastructure, for example, of Paris or anywhere in France if, uh, you know, their their demands aren't being met. But, um, you know, these Catalonian protesters in, uh, in that region have an equal, um, you know, <laughs> vigor to them. And we'll, we'll try to find um, someone to have on the podcast to discuss this subject matter, because, again, I don't want to misrepresent uh, exactly. the movement in any way. And, and, and like I said, you know, regardless of uh, whether or not it was a more is a more bougie um, uh, protest or not, I still think that uh, here in America, we could learn a lot from the resilience and the, yes. uh, you know, um, and obviously back. that's still likely largely dramatically to the left that even thing even in like Bernie Sanders is asking for like these people aren't trying to rip away health care or housing from individuals right these just he's talking about these aren't people who are looking to completely abandon you know capitalism as a structure yeah. which I, I mean even the most left of Americans in Congress or aren't if you Gavin and I talk about these ideas because we're normal people <laughs> but you'd never hear AOC mention anarchism as like yeah that's a good idea because you know <laughs> I mean I mean, again, like George Orwell has, I wish I would have been smart enough to write it down when I was reading it, but he has a quote talking about how in English anarchism, it might as well be like a, like a foreign word. I can't remember what he talks about, but it's like, it's a ridiculous term to even use. You can't communicate anything with the idea of anarchism. It's not like a. I even like remember. Word. I even remember when we interviewed um, Spike Cohen, who's of course uh, an anarcho-capitalist. So on the other, you know, side of uh, the conversation from leftism, of course. But I even remember when he um, was introducing himself on our podcast, he had to stress the fact that uh, although he is an anarcho-capitalist, he is in no way, or he was in no way, running on a platform of anarchy. You know, him and Joe Jorgensen for the presidency. Yeah, so, yeah it, it always has to be specified when it's brought up in American content. Like, no, 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 don't worry, I'm not in favor of just like you know, tearing down the whole government and destroying every, like, you know, sense of law and order. Like, you know, there's always a hundred caveats that have to be mentioned when you bring up anarchism. Because again, even like someone like my sister, uh, if I mention like, uh, you know, if I call myself an anarchist or, you know, say that I have anarchist tendencies, someone like my sister would be like, so you just think that like, everyone should just be running around, like burning things down to the ground. Yeah, or my sister, you know, who also, who works in politics, like, yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, I think, and, and I think that's uh, one of the, another great thing about reading this book and, you know, you do get a, a better understanding of the historical tradition of anarchism and what it's actually rooted in and, you know, how Orwell saw, saw it. Cause he, as he says at one point in the novel, he says uh, he actually felt like he identified with the anarchists, uh, you know, more so than the, even the militia he was with. Right. Yeah. And he talks about how he felt like a, a deep personal connection to the people. Right. And one of the other notice, and, and I wanted to talk about this uh, as it relates to, um, you know, the, the way I feel like a lot of the working class field now, uh, and obviously we're removed from this in a way that, uh, that uh, Orwell, or I mean, and, and all the people that he was describing were not. Um, but he, he writes of uh, the fact that uh, people were this like dramatic feeling of helplessness amongst the working class uh, during the wartime and how people constantly refer to the war and fighting as as it, is it going to start again? Will it start again? As if it's this like intangible force that people have no role or control in that it's just something that will happen or not. And and to me, it just stood out to me because it's exactly how people feel about our involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's like, will it end? Will Trump pull them out? Like, will Trump do it? Like these types of things as like, you know, it's almost like, and I guess that's a little bit different because, you know, we know that Trump has the ability for this to end, but uh, I mean, at the end of the day, on a day-to-day basis, like a lot of people just kind of feel this like overwhelming dread of like, you know, this is just a thing that exists in the background. This is like, just a, this is just a a form of like, will this strike again? Like, are we going to send, you know, more like, and obviously it's removed now because we're doing this with bombs and drones. So it's not a direct comparison. And uh, you know, there was a lot more, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think totally. And I think that, um, you know, as I said, I think part of the reason this book uh, was so enjoyable to me and I, I got so much out of it is just uh, how many parallels there are to the present, how much of uh, the state that he's talking about endures this. And, and also just with the more like, you know, soft fascism of the bourgeoisie, all of these concepts, I think, just uh, continue to uh, really um, ring true. And uh, Orwell just has so many great um, observations about about the the war the time Probably about the press also the press, the press. in wartime yeah that, that oh was, i brought this up a little bit on our last podcast when you know we were talking about how everybody like essentially now with trump refusing to accept the results of the election the press has almost had to go in two different directions like fox news is having this like <laughs> internal war because like you know they have, they have even you know some pundits who are like want to maintain like a some realm of credibility that they don't want to just shill for the president where it's like some have built their whole career shilling for the president and they plan to continue to after he loses, you know, so they don't want to like get on his bad side and they know that he watches. So uh, they're having this like internal breakdown. Um, but, you know, you look at the coverage that are going, that's coming out right now, you know, like um, Orwell wrote that like historians, um, would never be able to get a completely accurate and unbiased account of the Barcelona fighting because the records do not exist. Uh, they will have nothing to go upon except a massive accusations and party propaganda. Um, this is sounds something like that us, you yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds exactly like us, right? <laughs> like this, this is indicative of a failed state in a civil war. And we're a, a modern country with, the, you know, uh, the most uh, wealthiest nation of all time. A hundred percent. And, and yeah, the, 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 the point about the media is so, relevant remains so relevant and just that that quote you know uh so much of media is now party propaganda you know it's it's uh the parties or you know whichever team they're playing on interpretation of the reality and that's what they you know feed their um viewers so yeah and he talks about how it all comes from people who are at least uh multiple degrees away from the fighting and how it outraged him uh the fact that nobody who was there seeing it with their own eyes was ever reporting on it because it would never it would never meet the party line um you know that's the new york times how many foreign correspondents does the new york times have covering war right now basically zero probably all freelance if they get anything you know what i mean like i don't know any full-time staff war reporters for the new york times um maybe they have some but they're not doing you know uh they're not publishing that shit front you know front and center yeah yeah no you're totally right and uh, again, one of just the totally enduring things about this um, novel, the really just, um, again, it's just like, memoir. So, so memoir, sorry, the, uh, again, it's like so little has changed in, in some aspects when it comes to, um, you know, the left, the up against the media, up against itself. Um, I, there's so many uh, good lessons like that to take from this memoir. And um, 
yeah, the, I think the media is a huge one. It's just like it's something that um, any political movement is obviously up against, but is always wielded against the actual um, activist left. Yeah, and the left is always uh, smeared relentlessly on on both sides. The true left, right? The anarchists got it shit from both sides, right? They were taking it from all angles, right? Uh, you, you know, and so that and that's exactly how it's going to be um, in in any true revolution. So I guess just to leave you with one last question, I guess it's sort of like a a summer summation. You know, we talked about briefly at the beginning of the show uh, George Orwell's own evolving beliefs on pacifism and the justification of violence. Uh, do you think that violent revolution is inevitable? Do you think it, or do you think violent revolution is destined to result in violent revolution cyclically? I, I, there are a lot of different perspectives on the matter. I'm inclined to think maybe it's both. Yeah, I, I think it is a little bit of both. And I also think it's a little bit of like a, like a Phoenix situation where like uh, every once in a while um, it needs to be burned down to rise up again. You know, uh, fascism or authoritarianism does seem to be unfortunately kind of, uh, you know, the, the predictably, um, the predictable conclusion of societies or government. Or so, at least um, society under duress or failure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and definitely under, you know, capitalism. So um, it, 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 may be, it may be inevitable that that is the direction of societies, but I think that anarchism and, you know, these more revolutionary spirits will always uh, flourish, like I said, in resistance and in response to them. So uh, I think, you know, whether or not the question of is just violence justified kind of, I think is a little bit of a personal question. You know, if you're, uh, and this obviously, again, goes back to our discussion last week when we talked about, uh, you know, the, the, the V and V for Vendetta being in, influenced so much by the, you know, revenge. And, um, you know, if you are the victim of, uh, you know, a, a concentration camp, if you're the victim of, uh, you know, this extreme um, oppression, then I think that it's a slightly different question about um, is violence ever justified because someone like me or you who's, uh, you know, uh, in a place of relative privilege, having never actually been direct uh, victims of, you know, violence or torture or exploitation via the state um, on arbitrary measures like uh, color or religion. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's as easy to, to say, um, you know, personally, I, I do consider myself more of a pacifist, but again, uh, it's, it's easy to say that until your life has been directly, um, you know, or someone you love, for example, has been uh, directly influenced or, you know, um, had violence committed against them from the state or, you know, enabled by uh, these fascist systems. So I, I think it's a little bit of a complex system. I, ultimately, though, I do think that, you know, violent revolution does tend to be um, pretty inevitable. That's something we pretty observable throughout history. Although I, I do think that that is being counteracted a little bit by some of the, you know, comforts and conveniences of, of uh, modern day life. You know, it's something that uh, Aldous Huxley, you know, talked about in his, his uh, great dystopian novel, um, The Brave New World, where he envisioned a futuristic society where, um, you know, the be a mass great future episode. We, we, great, you know, yeah. We'll put that on the list. We might do that. 100%. And, and, and something that he talks about that I always uh, think about is, you know, how the government in that society um, kind of, um, you know, feeds the masses soma, which is like a, a pleasure drug that just keeps everyone. Um, you the know. Strokes have a really famous song called yeah. Soma. Yeah. Uh, Soma <laughs> is what, you know, yeah, everybody knows that one, but that's what they're talking about. Just PSA. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it basically keeps everyone, you know, just complacent. They don't, they don't really want to resist or uh, go out and deal with, uh, you know, fighting the state or whatever, because it's just like, I can just go home and, you know, take my Soma and, and chill out. Well, that's kind of where we are today with, you know, um, Netflix and McDonald's and all of these, you know, momentary fleeting pleasures that you can afford yourself and kind of just forget about uh, the reality of, of affairs, which of course, again, as we've talked about in a, in a society where, um, you know, the, the working class is exploited and, um, you know, doesn't have a lot of time. Your to margin achieve. for pleasure is so slim that they yeah, force you into it. Exactly. And, and, you know, if you're, and we talked about this the other day with radical democracy, Kamali Rose, our good friend of the show, I mean, if you're working a couple of jobs, you don't have time to be dealing with, uh, you know, activism or, or let alone even, um, you know, educating yourself to the fullest extent necessary that you would need uh, to engage activism. So um, I, I think uh, and, and, and again, if you are working two jobs then yeah, of course, you're going to want to spend your brief sliver of time, you know, enjoying yourself, not furthering your own 
uh, misery and or, whatever f- kind of quick burst of ecstasy yeah. you can you know get your hands on yeah i totally echo that and i, and I think that you know obviously you and i are you know only in like a tr- chin strokey like kind of um <laughs> preposterous way able to contemplate whether or not violence is ever justified of course we've only ever uh, had glimpses of it from mar- much you know uh miles of safety so uh, I, I obviously I think that there must you must challenge the the state monopoly on violence, right? This idea that they are the lone purveyors of just violence, and you know that obviously leads into you know this uh, um, acceptance that whatever is done by your side is justified because oh this is the atrocity that the other side did, and that kind of you know perpetuates this. And you know you can see how this logic is flimsy if you just look at how the state applies this logic to something like gang violence or anything like that. Uh, they per- they they portray it in this like you know way where it's like this is in, in no way different than what you're doing on an absolutely massive scale nope. um so of course the state monopoly on violence must be challenged and, and when i say you know violent revolution i'm not you know i i almost feel like that you know almost shouldn't include um you know defense and ret- but it, you know it's so it's almost more about like setting the limits of retaliation for me because obviously you, you want uh, fresh, oppressed people to liberate themselves through any means necessary. Uh, I, you know, I believe that they that, that that's right that any oppressed person has to liberate themselves. You know, through through any m- means that their you know oppressor is using to you know keep them down. Of course, however, uh, I I am reticent to get on board with this idea that. Uh, violence is a form of purification that the only way forward is through the ashes that there must be the shock there must be the storm there must be the destruction uh i i i don't want that to be the case though it clearly might be who am i to say that it's not smarter men than me have thought about it or women you know um but uh yeah i i I think that i think that it's just something where um this is why free speech is so important, right? Because if you take away free speech, the only method that you have left is to meet the state with violence, which I do not think anybody wants. However, uh, you know, as we've talked about on the show, the the left kind of wanting to uh, suppress uh, uh, at times, you know, information, while it might be disgusting, while it might be untrue, while it might be uh, debatedly harmful, though not constituting a direct threat of violence, which would make it already illegal under the First Amendment. But wanting to expand that, like Sasha Baron Cohen was arguing to take down election misinformation, or AOC was arguing that you know lying on campaign ads should be illegal, and all the kinds of things. Once you start doing that, you leave the door open for that to immediately be used to attack the left. So imagine, you know that now you can't even use your voice. It's almost like when Edward Snowden comes back, it, when he never will, but if he ever were to come back for a trial uh, in the United States, he wouldn't be able to make his case a- against the public, right? Only the case could be made against him because he's making a case that is outside of the official narrative, right? That is what you're essentially doing to the left. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're crippling your ability to make an argument. You're taking away your voice um, because it, as soon as it becomes unpalatable, th- this, uh, the, the parameters will change in a way that you're not comfortable and you've already given the green green light, which is why uh, people, uh, you know, fight so, um, you know, vehemently for uh, free speech. It's why Norman Finkelstein, the great writer and uh, thinker, uh, tried at least to publish an article in The Intercept. Glenn Greenwald revealed this in an interview that he tried to publish an article in The Intercept defending uh, Facebook and saying that they shouldn't have to take down anything, even if it is Nazi propaganda. And Norman Finkelstein, of course, had two parents, I believe, that were in the uh, Holocaust, if I'm not mistaken, or at least two very close relatives. This is a man that comes from, you know, a background of, um, you know, Jewish culture is just saying, you know, hey, this is that important that, you know, yes, this is smut. Yes, this is disgusting. Yes, this is wrong. Uh, but we can't take away people's right to say it as, because then Facebook's no longer a public platform, which means I can't say, you know, one, that that's horseshit, but also, hey, we need to look at this too. And when you start al- asking a private corporation to police your uh, word usage, then you start policing public thought. Because if words don't exist to express ideas, then those ideas don't exist, right? Um, so anyway, that's just my tangent. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, I mean, it's always uh, needs to be said. Uh, A lot of people don't um, understand the consequences of little, little infringements on free speech that uh, little, you know, polite forms of sense. We've already seen it. Jacobin's already been taken down. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it it always needs to be stressed. And I think that's probably a, a good place to end.
Yeah, 100%, guys. If you haven't read George Orwell, it's the George, or if you haven't read George Orwell, if you haven't read George Orwell, read George Orwell. But if you haven't read Homage to Catalonia, it's the George Orwell they do not want you to read in school. There's a reason. They don't tell you when you learn about George Orwell that he gets shot in the fucking throat, <laughs> loses his voice, and lives. It all happens in this book. True fucking story. Uh, you'll also get a little bit more radicalized reading it. I was. It's also really short, like yeah. 250 pages. It's a uh, good read. read. Yeah. Um, so yeah, everybody should check it out. Uh, we were able to find a free PDF online, but we won't shout it out because then it might get taken down. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, check it out guys. It's definitely worth, definitely worth reading. And uh, if anyone out there, um, you know, is an Orwell fan, or if you have some, you know, um, preconceived notions about George Orwell that may not be totally correct. I know there's some, uh, people on the left that like, uh, try to like smear him as like a, like a pro, you know, anti-Soviet pro Western propagandist, total horseshit. Total horseshit. Yeah, no. uh, the guy was a revolutionary himself. Orwell uh, is a comrade through and through. This dude got shot in the fucking neck for <laughs> anarchy. Yeah, for as an anarchist. Yeah, that's what I was going to add too. You know, not just as uh, some random bloke, but uh, yeah, he was a radical guy. Uh, you know, I think he a lot of his sentiments uh, are totally in line with you know modern day movements against authoritarianism and fascism. So there's a lot of great uh, you know stuff to extrapolate from his uh, you know writings about this period of time and to modern day. Uh, events but yeah thanks so much for everyone for watching if you haven't already make sure to uh, subscribe to our channel so you don't mix, miss the next um radical reads episode yeah our next radical reading uh for all you radical readers listening to radical reads <laughs> will be uh, an exploration into uh joseph conrad's quick little book um heart of darkness we're also going to be diving into francis ford coppola cinematic companion apocalypse now and we'll be discussing u.s imperialism uh so tune in guys that'll be next week's episode so uh we're looking forward to it see you then guys Have